Hello, people. I finished the book. In Michigan, I finished this book. Uh, I'm up here just for a couple of more days, and I'm going to head back to Florida. Uh, this book, Madhouse at the End of the Earth, this is about the Belgica uh, expedition to Antarctica. And this is the second book that I've read on that subject. And the Belgica is notable for the fact that uh, Amundsen was there, Cook was there, and, you know, Cook is the guy that claimed to have reached the North Pole, but Amundsen and Cook become very close friends on the Belgica. Uh, and de Gerlach is the, the leader of the expedition. Now, if you're not a Belgian, then you probably don't recognize that name, but the whole de Gerlach family is pretty famous in Belgium. Uh, they're all notable people, you know, from his grandfather to, to the surviving members of his family. It was a pretty good book. I, I really enjoyed it. I bought this in Florida. I actually have a book in Florida that I've finished that I still need to do the video for. But let's go ahead and get, uh, get to my notes. This was published in 2021. It's a first edition, which is nice to have. 331 pages. Uh, second book on the Belgic. I've already talked about that. The, the Belgic left Belgium in 1897. They didn't return for almost two years. Uh, they spent an entire winter locked in the ice in Antarctica and damn near came to where they had to spend another year. Uh, the footnote on page 118. Let's see where am I at here. Page 118. And this is just about... Uh, the, the latitude. Uh, the Antarctic Circle marks the latitude beyond which the sun remains in the sky for 24 hours straight at least once a year, and conversely remains below the horizon for a full day as well. So I'm sure that the Arctic Circle is the same thing. Uh, and this next thing that I'm going to read is about the decision to proceed south. And it wasn't a great decision for it's de Gerlach and a guy named LeConte. LeConte is uh, the captain of the ship. De Gerlach is the leader of the expedition. They are supposed to locate the magnetic South Pole. That's what the whole deal was. But they, they get a late start. They fuck around in Tierra del Fuego. Uh, and then when things are already at a point where it's too late... They decide to go south into the pack ice, and, and that's how they get stuck there. If this factored into de Gerlach's internal deliberations, it didn't make him any more cynical than other explorers. It was customary for expedition leaders to publish memoirs upon their return. This was in large part how they made their money, how they paid off creditors, and how they financed future expeditions. In the absence of easily accessible natural resources to exploit, stories were what polar explorers extracted from these barren ice scapes. And the best stories weren't the ones in which everything went well. While de Gerlach knew that trapping his men in the ice could lead to terrible suffering, he also had to have known that the suffering could be a down payment on future returns, financial and otherwise. Uh could probably read that next paragraph, but I'll skip it. So, he knows that it's stupid to proceed south, but he's got creditors, and, and he can't go back without doing anything. Uh, my next note is, says Clara Ward, Detroit. And these guys, as they're spending the winter, they get lonely for the comfort of women. And uh, one of the things they do is they clip pictures out of all these magazines of beautiful women and they hold their own beauty pageant with with photographs uh, and then they vote on, on who is the most beautiful woman and the one that gets the most votes is from my hometown of Detroit and her name is Clara Ward 
and and she's kind of an interesting character. She ends up, you know, marrying this prince of Belgium, and, and uh, it's kind of cool. It, it's it's worth a Google if you want to look at Claire Ward. Uh, bottom of one eighty one, top of one eighty two. It's freezing out here, so I'm trying to hurry through this. I wanted ice and snow. That's why I came back, and buddy, did I get it. Uh, two guys die from the expedition. A guy named Wanky, and uh, yeah, obviously I'm pronouncing that wrong. He gets swept overboard. And uh, there's a pretty, you know, like a eight pages dealing with when he gets swept overboard. Now, this was also in the last book I read, but this goes into much more romantic detail. One of the guys ties a rope to himself and jumps into the ocean and tries to save Winky. That was not in the first book, so I, I, you know, I'm really wondering whether that happened or not. Uh, and the next guy to die was Danko, and Danko was, uh, he, he was sickly. Uh, they all get scurvy, but those are the only two that die. It took only three weeks for the Antarctic to claim its next victim. Nansen the cat had been sick for a month. And, of course, Nansen the cat is named after Fridjhoff Nansen, uh, the guy that took, uh, took his ship and, and purposefully had it frozen in the ice of the Arctic and let it go around. And he tried to reach the, the, the North Pole, but he never made it. Uh, amazing story, and Nansen was a pretty heroic guy. Nansen the cat had been sick for a month. Her illness seemed to mirror Danko's, but unlike the lieutenant who had man maintained his grace and equanimity until his dying breath, Nansen showed signs of mental degeneration. Once sweet and affectionate, she had grown vicious and saturnine and avoided her shipmates. His mind has wandered, and from his changed spiritual attitude, we believe that his soul has wandered too, Cook wrote on June 26th. A day or two ago, his life departed. We presume for more congenial regions. We are glad his torture has ended, but we miss Nansen very much. The cat's death affected the men deeply, not least because she had been, as Cook put it, the only speck of sentimental life within reach. There was actually two cats when they started out, and the other cat, I think it was LeConte, uh, the other cat shit on the deck, and LeConte picked it up by the neck and threw it into the ocean. So, their cats do not make it. Uh, scurvy. They all get scurvy. And everybody knows that scurvy. I'm fascinated with scurvy. Fascinated with why it took fucking 300 years to figure it out. Why they kept finding out how to cure it, and then they would forget. There, there's many, many reasons. Uh, one of the reasons I don't think I've ever spoke about before is once cross-ocean voyages didn't take as long as they did before, people didn't get scurvy, so they kind of forgot about it. But these guys are stuck out there, they all get scurvy. And they do figure out that eating uh, penguin meat and eating seal meat, as long as you don't overcook it, there's vitamin C in there. And, and uh, it will cure the scurvy, or at least it, it will somewhat cure the scurvy. Some of the guys refuse to eat it, because apparently penguin is not too good. But, but uh, they do kind of get over it. Uh, tonight. They have explosives on there that they brought to help them get out in case they get trapped in the ice. And, and it's not dynamite, it's called tonite. And uh, their tonite, in large part, gets ruined from the cold and the heat when they're crossing the equator. But it helps a little bit. And they talk about uh, preparing explosives, trying to break a hole in the ice, and praying to St. Barbara. The, and they say that St. Barbara is the patron saint of artillery men. And so I did Google St. Barbara. And yes, among other things, St. Barbara is the patron saint of miners and artillery men. 
second and third paragraph on page 304. I may not upload this until I get back to Florida because there is no Wi-Fi here. And, and if this goes over 10 minutes, which it's at 10 minutes right now, uh, it, it'll take me like half a day to upload it. Second and third paragraph. In the spring of 1926, Amundsen took off aboard the dirigible Norge with a 16-man team that included Lincoln Ellsworth and the airship's Italian designer and pilot, Umberto Nobile, who insisted on bringing along his yapping lapdog, Tatina. The Norge reached the pole on May 12, 1926, and hovered over the spot long enough for Amundsen, Ellsworth, and Nobile to drop, respectively, the Norwegian, American, and Italian flags. Just three days earlier, the American pilot Richard Byrd had returned from a flight over the Arctic aboard a trimotor monoplane, during which he circled the North Pole, or so he claimed. Doubts about his exploit were raised from the moment he landed. Recent examinations of his diary have vindicated the skeptics, showing that Byrd had attempted to erase sextant data that conflicted with his later typewritten report and would have placed him a good distance short of his goal. Likewise, in the 1980s, the National Geographic Society analyzed newly available documents related to Robert Perry's 1909 trek to the pole and cl concluded that he, too, most likely had falsified his record. If neither Cook, nor Perry, nor Byrd reached the pole, as is the overwhelming consensus, then the prize belongs to Amundsen. So Amundsen... That's it, I don't have anything else to read. Amundsen was the first guy to sail the Northwest Passage. It took him two years, he got frozen in there. He's the first guy to hit the South Pole. That's an amazing story because he was racing Scott, and of course Scott and, and multiple other guys died on the way back. And according to this paragraph, he was also the first guy to reach the North Pole. Uh, all these explorers are kind of weird characters, Amundsen included. Thanks for watching.